Hello. On behalf of the Harris County Sheriff's Office, we want to welcome you to this discussion that we're going to have today about suicide prevention. The month of September is Suicide Prevention Month, and for many it can be a difficult conversation to have. Today, we want to acknowledge the realities that mental health is real and the struggles can be very strong for many. But we want to let you know that there is help and there is hope out there. Throughout the broadcast, I'll be checking through the Facebook Live feed to see if you have any questions that you are curious about. If there's any information that we can provide to help our citizens access the mental health care services that are available, that is what our goal is today. My name is Eric Uregas, and I'm a deputy with the Sheriff's Office, and currently I am the Behavioral Health Training Coordinator for our agency. My job is to train all of our personnel, the crisis intervention and behavioral health uh, topics, so that they're better prepared to interact with these situations as these calls come in. In addition to training at our academy, I've also had the opportunity to work both in our jail complex and in our patrol bureau. As we go through this, I want to emphasize the importance of reaching out whenever it is that you believe you need help. Nationally, access to mental health care and services continues to be a hurdle for many Americans. And as a result, when someone falls into mental health crisis, it's often the police officers that are responding to these calls. Today we're going to discuss some of the steps that the Harris County Sheriff's Office has taken in order to address the topic of mental health and suicide awareness. In collaboration with the, with the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD, we have raised the standards to provide the best care for the citizens of Harris County. Furthermore, we also realize that within our own agency, our own personnel need access to mental health care and services as well in order to stay in the best mental mind frame to serve our citizens of Harris County. To discuss these topics today, we have with us Wayne Young, the CEO of the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD, and Dr. Thomas McNeese, the director of our Behavioral Health Division. So I'd like to give you guys a quick second to introduce yourselves and tell us what your role is. Absolutely. And I appreciate everybody joining us today. My name is Wayne Young and I have the privilege of being the CEO for the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD. And the Harris Center is the public mental health system, the safety net mental health system for Harris County. So I'm Dr. Thomas McNeese. I'm a psychologist, a clinical psychologist. Uh, my role here at the Sheriff's Office is I'm director of the Behavioral Health Division. And what the Behavioral Health Division uh, does is we're an embedded um, mental health resource within the sheriff's office. So sheriff uh, established us in 2020 and basically we have four roles. We do consultation within the sheriff's office. Uh, we're available 24 seven for critical incident response and post critical incident response. Um, we're over the peer support team. Uh, we're responsible for education and outreach and uh, most importantly, I think we also run an internal mental health clinic that's voluntary and confidential for our employees. Um, so that's, that's my role. Thank you, gentlemen. So to start off, I want to discuss training. Training is the foundation of what it is that we do um, in this line of work to be able to provide the best services to the citizens of our county. Um, we know that family members often call 911 when their loved ones fall into crisis with, again, the emphasis on suicides and suicidal ideations. Uh, this can be a scary decision for many, many family members as they know shortly after the call is made, it'll be police officers generally that are responding and will be uh, tasked with transporting their loved ones to the hospital. Uh, personally, not only as a deputy, but as a family member of several family members that deal with mental health issues. You know, I want to know that the responders that are going to be making it to my residence or 
uh, wherever I am at the time the call is made, I want to know that they have the best training and knowledge possible um, to be able to interact with my loved one safely um, and get them transported to wherever it is that they need to go at that time. Um, the reality is police officers are not mental health providers, um, but continually they find themselves responding to these crisis calls and trying to balance safety uh, with symptom recognition, communication, and the preservation of life, ultimately. So one of the things that I wanted to address is at the Sheriff's Office, we're continually trying to raise the standards for training when it comes to crisis recognition um, and mental health awareness in general. Um, not only for the calls for service that we run, but also to maintain our own personal mental health um, and to share that information with the citizens that we come across uh, in public. So part of what we do uh, on the training side for our personnel is we train all of our officers, uh, whether they're working in uh, patrol or detentions at some point, uh, we get them in and we train them in 40 hours of crisis intervention training, uh, which generally exposes them to the most common mental health conditions they can expect to encounter. Uh, while doing the job, uh, but it also focuses heavily on crisis communication and de-escalation and how to recognize um, when someone may be in a crisis. You know, crisis is not always dealing with mental health issues. It's uh, a person having a terrible day based on a very significant or traumatic incident. So we want our officers to be able to be versatile in, in their interactions and know how to communicate effectively uh, to the individuals they come across. Um, in addition to the 40 hours of training they get in crisis intervention, we also train in 16 hours additionally of de-escalation training uh, as well as active bystandership. And keep in mind all of these topics have a suicide component to it. So it, it focuses on uh, how to de-escalate and interact with those individuals in, in those circumstances. Uh, but more importantly, the tactics that are involved to keep not only the officers safe, but the individuals in crisis. Um, so those are, those are important core topics that we believe all of our personnel should be trained in um, if, if they're going to be doing the job and coming into contact with these situations. Um, in addition to that, we take great pride in delivering the most current standards um, as far as most up-to-date up statistics, um, any changes in the curriculums that are made, and we try to meet and exceed uh, the state standards for training. Um, Wayne, in regards to training, can you tell us more about the collaboration between the Sheriff's Office and the Harris Center when it comes to the Zero Suicide Initiative? I can, absolutely. It, it's an exciting partnership and, and collaboration and focus. Um, the zero suicide is a, a model and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of the content of it here in a few minutes but um, it is a, a transform, transformative approach to preventing and reducing suicide and providing suicide safer care um, and just in the last few months we have already trained over 600 deputies um, we've trained half of the Harris Center staff that's um, located here um, in the jail that serves um, residents that are here we also have um, been asked by the Harris Health medical staff to participate in that training and they want to be a partner in this work and we're excited about that. Um, it now, that training is now embedded in um, all new hire um, detention officer training. So anybody that comes in will automatically have that before they even get through the, the orientation period um, and be able to know that they've got a base level of knowledge associated with that. And that training um, includes a basic overview of suicide. It includes some of the risks that comes um, with suicides in, in um, incarcerated residents and populations. It talks a bit about risk factors and warning signs associated, particularly in a corrections environment because it is different, it's a different context. People, um, just the nature of being sometimes incarcerated is a crisis component or, or situation for some individuals. Um, and it also provides a nice overview of zero suicide and what that initiative is and um, the focus of that. Absolutely. And in addition to the, to the training of our personnel, uh, the Sheriff's Office has also implemented um, a few programs to address the concerns of responding to crisis 
um, in, com in the community. Uh, one of those is the Crisis Intervention Response Team, or also known as CERT. Um, this is a fantastic program that pairs a certified mentally health trained deputy with a master's level or higher clinician um, in the same vehicle. So when they're responding to these calls for service, uh, there's an opportunity to evaluate individuals while on scene without the need of having to transport them to uh, a hospital or any other facility before they can address uh, the crisis at hand. Um, you know, I think that's incredibly important in a lot of the calls that we run. You know, when, when officers arrive on scene, individuals are agitated, individuals may be armed, uh, you know, they may be barricaded. So having access to a clinician on scene um, can really help get these situations under control safely uh, without necessarily having to go in there forcefully. Um, it gives them an opportunity to uh, receive that initial evaluation to determine whether or not you know the immediate transport is necessary um, from the scene. Uh, the CERT clinicians have also been able to conduct these assessments or at least start that process uh, while en route to some of these calls uh, being that they have access to a lot of the mental health records uh, before they ever arrive on scene. So as long as we know uh, the patient's name and their date of birth, uh, if, if, if a caller were to call in and, and, and give that, uh, the dispatcher can forward that information on the call slip um, and that, that CERT deputy can give that information to the clinician and they can access that information so they understand more or less um, you know, what they're responding to. Now, obviously with information like that, there are memorandums of understandings and things that are in place to protect patient information, so that's not something that's freely given out. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is a great benefit to have that um, to more or less understand the state of mind of, of who you may be dealing with. Um, in addition to CERT, another program that we have is the Clinician and Officer Remote Evaluation uh, Program, or it's also known as CORE. Uh, and essentially, it, it functions similarly to what CERT does, uh, but the exception is instead of having a physical clinician in the vehicle with a deputy, uh, instead they'll carry around with them a tablet that has access to telehealth services uh, that provide, again, a very similar function to what CERT um, could do. Now, the Harris County Sheriff's Office is the liaison agency for uh, the core program, and currently we have including ourselves, 14 uh, agencies uh, that are using this service. So currently there's over 350 um, telehealth iPads that are out in the districts throughout Harris County uh, that are able to use these services uh, while they're still on scene. Um, in a study that was done in 2019 when we piloted uh, the program, it showed that in that year, 88% of calls for service where the core element was used, when that iPad was used, 88% uh, of those situations were able to be de-escalated by giving the person the opportunity to speak to a clinician rather than speak to a police officer. And I think that that's something that is super helpful when you're dealing with individuals that are in a mental health crisis. You know, when you look at it, from the perspective of the, the police interaction, um, persons that are choosing to do something wrong is much different than a person that is dealing with uh, something going on in, in, with their mental health that maybe not, they may not even understand the choices that they're making. So I think it's very important that not only do we train our deputies to, to pick up on those things and recognize that, uh, but also have access to these programs and services uh, to better assist and, and, and provide the services necessary to uh, treat these individuals that, that are going through these things. So, the reality is sometimes uh, these calls for service do result in criminal charges. We understand that, um, you know, sometimes a person in crisis may commit a crime. Uh, however, one of the things that I think is incredibly important that has been passed in some of the rec recent uh, legislative sessions is a, a specific emphasis on diverting individuals from the criminal justice system to 
the mental health care system. And part of that is achieved uh, due to Article 16.22 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, which is diversion of a person uh, suffering from mental illness. Um, under this code, to, to paraphrase it, uh, essentially what it states is each peace officer shall make a good faith effort to divert a person uh, suffering from mental health issues if certain criteria are met. Okay, so part of this criteria includes um, one, the person has to be suffering from mental health issues and that does include substance abuse uh, or substance use. Uh, number two, the person has to have committed a criminal offense um, a misdemeanor other than one involving violence, and three, the reason the offense occurred was due to the person's overall mental state. Um, one facility that we have here in Harris County uh, that we use frequently is the Diversion Center. And the Diversion Center is located on 6160 South Loop East Freeway, and it's a, it's a facility that uh, uh, an officer can transport someone to who's accused of committing a misdemeanor offense other than one involving violence. Uh, they can transport them there to receive treatment and services in lieu of going to jail. And the nonviolent misdemeanor offenses that we commonly see that have that mental health component are things like criminal trespass, uh, you know, misdemeanor theft. Uh, we see uh, you know, minor public disturbances and things like that where these individuals are out uh, maybe in the middle of an intersection or something like that being disorderly and, and, you know, historically we have arrested for those types of offenses. And when it comes to mental health treatment, environment matters. And we know that jail is not the best place to receive mental health treatment. So if there is an opportunity to utilize a different service and there is uh, access to other programs, um, ultimately it's generally best for the individual um, if we take that route in lieu of keeping them um, in a jail facility. Um, unfortunately, uh, however, we do know that people still do ultimately get arrested. You know, when you start crossing into that, that realm of felony offenses and things like that, or offenses involving family violence or uh, assault, you know, arrests may be made even though the person may have um, a mental health issue. Uh, but with that in mind, Wayne, can you help explain to us sort of how the diversion process can still pick up when they make it to the processing center? Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So, so um, there's, there's multiple, multiple points of diversion, like as you said. One of them happens with the officer directly. Sometimes they we we'll call the DA intake line. Sometimes they make it to the booking center um, and are in that process. And, and um, through that booking process, there are several screening questions and other places where red flags can be raised. Um, and suddenly there might be an awareness that this is perhaps a mental health concern. And so um, midstream, um, a deputy might identify that this is potentially something that was really a result of mental illness and not some sort of kind of criminal intent. Um, and they can bring them to us. We have on site in the, in the Joint Processing Center 24 seven, we have mental health clinicians that are on duty um, who can um, look at the history, look at the records, have a brief screening of that individual um, and perhaps give input that perhaps diversion might be uh, a better outcome for that individual. And if so, then we can transport them to that diversion center you mentioned. Um, the diversion center in the last five years, we've diverted over 8,000 people um, from jail, pre-charge, um, to your point, sometimes people resist treatment just because it's associated with the criminal justice system, right? And so um, being able to operate that center in partnership um, with the law enforcement agencies in Harris County and partnership with the district attorney's office and um, the county elected officials has been a, a really huge, huge impact. And, and I want to reemphasize what you said there, which is that these are for low-level nonviolent charges, right? right? These are not people who have created harm in our community. These are people who um, I think most of us look at them and think there's nobody benefiting from that person going to jail. This, how might we get them help? How might we connect them to treatment? But if that's missed on that front end and they make it into the booking process, there's still an opportunity. Um, we've recently added access at that diversion desk. It's literally a desk that's in the, in the building. We've recently added access um, for real-time consultation with, this, with ADAs, with the assistant district attorneys, so that we can reach out to them, even if perhaps some discussion had been had about 
charges that might be appropriate, we can say, look, do we need to reconsider this? This doesn't seem to be a, a situation where the public safety is gonna be served by this individual being arrested. Um, and so that conversation can happen. Ultimately, those decisions are really made in partnership with the DA's office and the law enforcement um, officer, deputy that's involved in that. Um, but we can help facilitate that. We can help bring awareness to the fact that there might be a, a value in that diversion. And um, it's exciting to be able to you know, kind of catch that midstream um, and be able to get those individuals connected to help rather than just um, incarceration. Right. right. And, and then, then for individuals that are, are, they don't meet the requirements or, or the, the ability to be diverted um, and they, they do in fact get booked in, um, can you tell us what percentage of people in our, in our custody um, suffer from mental health issues and, and, and what type of treatments does the Harris County Jail offer uh, for persons that deal with mental health issues? Absolutely, and, and it's, it's pretty, pretty robust. robust. I, I don't, my, my guess, guess is most individuals don't realize how much services, services and supports are available in the jail. jail. Um, we, we have 24-7 psychiatric coverage. Um, we have at intake, we have crisis supports, and we have ongoing monitoring and care delivery supports. Um, so everybody that comes in is screened. Um, I will say people, the. There is a difference between people who come in who have a mental health history or mental health challenges and those who seek treatment or receive treatment. People still have the right to refuse treatment. That this isn't this isn't a mandatory treatment kind of setting or context. There is a process for that in our in our state, but uh, most individuals who come into the jail, if they don't want to receive services, they don't have to. Um, but if they want to, we want to be there. We want to be able to support them. We have you know over 150 team members that provide that care and support. Um, we have. Um, psychiatrists and nurse practitioners and PAs who provide that care. There's almost 20 of those individuals that are part of our team. Um, we have PA fellows, we have residents that rotate through because we think it's important learning. Um, more and more individuals with mental health issues are coming in contact with the criminal justice system um, despite efforts to divert and deflect. And, and I should say, if I don't think probably most people realize um, the sheriff's office is well ahead of where most of law enforcement agencies are in our country around addressing mental health needs. In fact, they're recognized as a learning site by the, the Council of State Governments. Other law enforcement agencies um, and communities come into ours regularly, probably once every other week almost, to tour and see what um, kind of programs and supports the Sheriff's Office provides, what those engagements in the community look like, and probably not something that, that the Sheriff's Office will brag on themselves about, but I think it's important for our community to know. Um, so we, um, on any given day, we have over 500 contacts, um, service delivery with individuals who are incarcerated residents who are here. Um, that includes care coordination, psychiatry evaluations, medication management. Um, there are, um, at any given time, there are about 3,000 people um, who are on psychiatric medications that are in the Harris County Jail, so about a third of that population. Um, I will say, though, and I mentioned earlier, there are more people who might meet criteria who might have a diagnosis of mental health concern or condition, um, but they might have declined treatment, or maybe the medication isn't the right treatment or approach for them. Um, there are also, a lot of people that I don't think realize, there are over um, there are 480 beds that are mental health and transition services beds. So there's specialty beds, specialty areas within the jail where people who have mental health concerns can receive more intensive treatment and support and monitoring. Um, and so all of that is a part of those services that, um, that we provide on behalf of the Sheriff's Office and at the request of the Sheriff's Office to those that are here. Um, also, I probably um, should mention there are a group of individuals who come in whose mental health issue is so significant um, that they're not competent to stand trial. They, they have to go through a competency restoration process. And historically, people have waited on state hospital beds for a really long time for that restoration service to happen. Um, in a way that I don't think any of us feel great about. I think everybody knows there's a wait list and nobody really um, thinks that that's an um, ideal situation. Um, and so it, it started with a, a kind of a seed grant from the state to provide competency restoration services within the jail to help restore people's, restore competency sooner so that they, individuals can go through that process and resolve their charge and, and get it addressed. Um, and then the county invested in additional supports and additional beds. And so today we've got a total of um, 50 competency restoration beds and another 20 transition beds associated with people who've been restored and we're helping manage and support them um, until they can, can navigate their way through that criminal justice process. Um, so we have a team dedicated to that. Um, I'll brag on them a little bit. The currently 89% of the people that have gone through that restoration program have been restored to competency. Um, uh, 
the um, number is significant of those that would have been waiting for longer and for a state hospital bed. They would have been waiting times for up to a year for that. So to be able to restore them more quickly, um, more successfully um, while they're here allows them again to reduce the um, engagement with the criminal justice system as rapidly as possible. So those are kind of the breadth and scope of the services that are available Absolutely. within the jail. Absolutely, and I, and I can speak you know, personally just from the experience of having worked in the jail for many years. Uh, the, the scope in which the programs cover and, and, and the variety of different types of um, interactions and, and symptoms that are addressed in a jail setting. Um, you know, many times people fall in crisis simply for, for being in custody. The, the, the fact that, you know, they're, they're in a jail facility, uh, they're facing criminal charges, uh, they don't know what to expect. Uh, that stress can, can really have an effect on a person and uh, unfortunately we do see a lot of individuals that get to the point where they start having suicidal ideations. Um, so I'm definitely appreciative of the services that the Harris Center provides in, in the Harris County Jail to uh, the individuals that are, that are incarcerated in there currently. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail on, uh, about what the Zero Suicide Initiative is? Yeah, yeah I, I would be, be happy to. I think we're, we're really, really proud of the effort and focus. Um, I, I also want to say this is the first jail in the country that is implementing Zero Suicide. Um, it has been implemented in healthcare settings, it's been implicated in, in, implemented in one prison setting, um, but it is very forward leaning and I, I want to just publicly express appreciation to Sheriff Gonzalez for his commitment to this. I know that Personally, he feels strongly about this. He has lended a lot of personal support to this. Um, and so, but, but zero suicide is really kind of an aspirational challenge and a practical framework to begin to think about system-wide transformation, right? It, there's, it, there are certainly risk factors to identify and to watch out for and those kind of things, but it's really about how do you create a culture and a climate and a setting where everybody is intentional about watching out for concerns and trying to provide the safest environment possible for those individuals who might be at risk for suicide and, and perhaps also have mental health concerns. Um, it is, it, it's a little bit complex in its way of thinking. It'd be simpler if we just had, here's the 10 things to watch for, and if you see it, check a box and call somebody, but that doesn't really capture it, right? If that were that simple, no one would ever die from suicide in, in a jail setting, right? It, it's more complicated than that, so the solution has to be a little more complex. Um, overall, there are seven kind of evidence-based elements that have been proven to impact suicide risk, and by trying to implement each one of those elements and address each one of those, we can holistically create a safer environment and provide safer care um, and reducing that risk for suicide. Um, it, it really has begun, I think, will set the standard for jails in safer suicide care uh, by using that more holistic approach. I think it will move us beyond the checkbox or just the risk observation component to this um, and really have us think about how do we identify, how do we intervene, and how do we treat the causes of that suicide ideation. Um, in many cases, we were talking earlier before we got started, you know, people often associate real closely suicide and mental health, and that is fair, and there is a, certainly a correlation. Um, but you don't have to have a mental illness to, to um, attempt suicide or have suicide ideation, and so sometimes just the mere crisis scenario might trigger that. So how might we provide that, came, that care? Again, it, it um, is all about trying to address those elements and, and improve that. So it, it's also probably important to note that, that the Harris Center is on our own zero suicide journey. We're, we're helping facilitate and partnering um, in this work here in the jail, but we're also implementing that in our own agency. Um, you know, being the public mental health system for Harris County, um, a lot of the people we serve struggle with suicide. And so how do we create that safety? How do we create that safety in our system? And then we have been designated as the Regional Suicide Care Support Center for our region, that there are um, nine other local mental health authorities, public mental health systems that surround Harris County um, that are in our region, and we are that lead agency for that, and so we are helping guide uh, not only our system, but other systems outside of correctional settings in that journey. Um, and really, but I think it's particularly um, compelling to me to think about how we take those lessons learned across all those agencies and implement those best practices um, into a jail setting? How do we take some individuals that are particularly at risk um, and, and translate that into action for us? And so certainly that incorporates um, screening and assessment methods, 
looking at new collaborative training as we talked about earlier in the training portion of our discussion. Uh, information sharing, you talked about that earlier. It, we have to be cautious about individuals' rights and not over disclosing or not um, creating access to information that people shouldn't have or don't need to have. Um, but when appropriate and, and legal and, and necessary, being able to, to share that information um, for both incarcerated residents and officers to ensure that resources um, are provided and, and services are provided for those that need that support. Absolutely. You guys are doing a lot of great work when it comes to addressing these, these very real concerns. Um, Dr. McNeese, at the beginning I mentioned that in addition to the interactions that we have um, with the citizens of our county on, with calls for service, um, mental health crisis calls and things like that, um, even our own personnel need to uh, take steps necessary to, to safeguard their own mental health, to, to be able to stay in tip top shape to serve the citizens um, and to come to work and to, to be able to go home safely at the end of the day and, and, and have you know, an overall just good state of well-being. Uh, by virtue of the job itself, you know, our, our officers are, are predisposed to experiencing stress and trauma, um, specifically due to the repeated exposure at high frequencies to very traumatic events on the variety of different types of calls they can, they can get called out to. Um, and, and by no means does that mean it only applies to patrol. That, that is something that crosses the threshold into detentions as well. Um, unfortunately, we all know that over the years, law enforcement officers and, and, and many other first responders as well have, have committed suicides. Um, how, how often does this happen? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, this job attracts people. It's a noble profession that attracts people with, with good intentions. The job does change people over time. And the, um, the sheriff's office has, it's a, in a unique situation where it has law enforcement officers, detention officers, communication officers, civilians, um, and they're all affected by, um, uh, by their job. And so in terms of law enforcement, the average uh, exposure to critical incidents over a, a career is, uh, the number that, that's out there is 188 uh, exposures to critical incidents. And when we talk about that at the academy, sometimes with seasoned officers, there's a, they kind of chuckle because that, that's not Harris County. <laughs> you know, they say we, we're, we see more uh, critical events than that because we're busier than a small agency somewhere. And so critical events like that could be uh, exposure to a child fatality. It could be um, uh, ex witnessing somebody commit suicide, uh, uh, a gruesome um, scene that they show up to, those kinds of things. And over time, that takes a toll on a person, obviously. Um, law enforcement officers uh, are at a much higher risk of suicide. Detention officers, I think, are double the risk of law enforcement officers. And, uh, of course, communication officers as well. They uh, oftentimes hear a call and don't know what happened at the end of that call. They don't have a resolution as to, to what happened. Um, so having said that, uh, it's important to have resources available to help uh, people in this profession. And that's where we come into play. Um, I noticed there were questions that we need to... Yes. To address those or I want to ask uh, we'll start with this one mm -hmm. um, how can friends family members or colleagues provide support to someone who is at risk of suicide um, so I think it, it, it's important kind of like you were saying a while ago there's uh, this misconception that if I'm considering suicide then there must be something wrong with me I must be mentally ill there must be something severely wrong with me in reality, anybody can find themselves in a situation where they're experiencing suicidal ideations. It doesn't take somebody to be diagnosable with a severe mental illness. That if somebody does have a severe mental illness, it might make them more prone to uh, consider suicide or complete suicide. But anybody can find themselves there. Um, it's been described uh, kind of as a ramp where you go down a ramp over time and find yourself in this valley valley of suicide. Uh, Sam Buser, who works with the fire department, uh, talks about that. 
And once you're in that valley of suicide, um, oftentimes it's impulsive. Something will happen that will make a person complete the suicide. So what, what a person can do is simply show up, be empathetic, and ask. Ask directly, uh, are you considering suicide? Uh, are you feeling like hurting yourself? And asking that direct question doesn't make it more likely that the person will commit suicide or consider suicide, but it'll make it more likely that they'll talk about it and feel right. open to the discussion. Right, because the reality is many, many individuals who experience suicidal ideations or um, just crisis in general, many of them just want to be heard. And, and I think that that's something that's incredibly important. Um, Wayne, this would be a good question for you. That this one says, the VA does not provide health care services to veterans in custody. What does the Harris Center have available for veterans in our custody to assist with their specialized needs? Yeah, it is a great question. Um, and you're right. Unfortunately, sometimes there are more veterans than any of us would want that are, that are incarcerated residents um, here in the Harris County Jail. And so our staff have been well trained. Um, around trauma, obviously, veterans one of the one of the risks associated with their profile is that they have been exposed to repeated um, and sometimes horrendous traumas. And so, understanding that, understanding the culture of military and of veterans, um, we have we we formed one of the first MOUs. Well, we formed the first MOU with a local VA to be able to help facilitate transitions of care between the VA and us. So that if there's a veteran, we know that the um, eligibility for services in the VA can be complicated, right? It's not, not, not bad intentionally so, but it can be difficult to understand. And so we created a smooth handoff process. Um, and if they cannot receive services um, in the VA, they can certainly receive services on, with us on an outpatient basis. And certainly if they're an incarcerated resident, then they will have access to all those services I described. Um, and our staff do have particular and specific training around um, those with military service and experience. I will also say a part of our workforce includes um, peer support professionals, and we do have um, peer support professionals who also have lived experience in the military um, who are veterans, and so we can connect that as well, if not while incarcerated, certainly after release as well. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to take a, a minute to address some of these uh, patrol-related questions. Um, the first one says, what is the protocol if someone calls in a person having a mental crisis? Suppose this person has left the area and moved to another area. Do the dispatchers have a responsibility to alert other deputies? Um, information is incredibly important. If you are a loved one calling uh, because you, you want to get someone in your family help, the more information that we as the responders have uh, about the situation, about the location, uh, about um, all the different factors that, that we're looking for, such as um, is the person alone, is anyone else with them, are there presence of any weapons, is the person agitated, are they under the influence of anything? Uh, all this information is incredibly important, but if the person does leave the location and the caller has a good idea more or less or maybe even the exact uh, location of, of where they think they may be going um, giving that information to the dispatcher is incredibly important uh, the dispatchers have the ability to update our call notes as we're in route so any additional information that a caller would provide we would be able to see it um, and that that includes if a it, let's say you live on the boundary of of two different districts um, if, if you're going from, say, our District 1 to our District 2, um, we're able to update that information and alert the deputies on the other district if the person is, in fact, moving in that direction. So uh, the flow of information is incredibly important, um, and the more up-to-date and accurate uh, that it is, the more safer of a response and we can provide. Uh, the next question says, what happens if the police cause a mental breakdown to escalate? What happens if their actions actually cause the problem? Um, the reality is, again, police officers are not mental health professionals. And 
you know, historically, law enforcement has not always been trained in crisis recognition or uh, just mental health awareness in general. And we have made a lot of mistakes in this line of work responding to these crisis calls. Um, there have been several incidents that you can look back on and say that the manner in which the officers responded did in fact escalate a situation uh, when someone was in crisis. What we do now is really focus in on the crisis communication aspect in our training. That's one of the things that we put our personnel through. Uh, we put them through some very realistic scenarios uh, that challenge their thought process, that challenge their ability to think quickly um, given a number of different factors. Um, I think training is something that is always in need of continual uh, pro progress and every single year the Harris County Sheriff's Office mandates that all of our personnel um, on patrol go through eight hours of refresher training. Um, it doesn't matter if you've taken a class in the past, um, we're going to put you through more training. And generally, outside of the state mandates that govern the training that is mandated, um, we can create our own curriculums that address uh, specific topics or specific conditions that we see are becoming more common for our deputies to encounter. Um, so that is a very real um, concern of ours is when our deputy responds, are they prepared to recognize those behaviors and be able to, to safely interact with those individuals without escalating or being the escalating factor um, in those incidents? Regarding something family or friends could do uh, is really learn about law enforcement culture. The book Survivor for Law Enforcement by Kevin M. Gilmartin is a good start. It may be an idea to offer this book to the cadets or newly married couples or family members so they can better connect. I find most officers are closed off in discussing their day, their day-to-day -day work lives as to not worry us or feeling that we can't connect. And I appreciate that, that comment. I think it's, it's a reality for those of us that are, that are in the profession and, and see the things and are exposed to the things that we are on, on such high frequency. Um, you know, with regards to, the, to that statement there, I, uh, there are some things that I would feel comfortable and have no issue explaining or, or, or telling friends or family, and there's others that, you know, I'm just, I don't really have a desire to open up with. Um, but all in all, that is a great book. I have read it, and if, if you're interested to learn more about the career and what's all entailed, then I highly recommend that you read that book. There's a similar one, too, called I Love a Cop mm -hmm. uh, for family members of, of people in law enforcement. Absolutely. Um, here's another question. How can schools, workplaces, or communities create an environment that promotes mental well-being and reduce the risk of suicide? We can, we can both take a stab yeah, at it. So I'll, I'll let you speak specifically to your culture. I, I tell people all the time, organizations, and mine is no different, right? So we, while we are a group of mental health professionals, we have mental health challenges. I, I lead a large organization. We have about 2,700 team members in our organization. Um, and I think part of it is normalizing it, right? Having an honest conversation, bringing it up, um, not having it be a taboo subject, allowing it to be something that we talk about and we bring resources to, um, providing supports and services to individuals, particularly when there's something really significant happens um, in settings, bringing in mental health resources to provide immediate supports. Um, and so that normalizing piece, you know, none of us are, um, avoid being impacted. I think the, the great equalizer in this has been the pandemic. 
I don't know that anybody that has, I don't know anyone that hasn't been impacted by mental health concerns through this pandemic, right? And so being able to normalize that, being able to talk about your own mental health experiences, your own impacts personally, um, publicly with employees is reassuring to them. It allows them to know it's okay and it's comfortable to talk about. Um, I talk routinely about being in long-term recovery myself and with my workforce and work group. And so um, creating a culture of okayness and willingness to talk about it, I think, goes a long, long way. Um, now, I'll let you talk about that because it's your well, day job, actually. Well, right? and that's, so. that, I think everything you said makes perfect sense. And the way it's, it's mapped onto what we do here at the Sheriff's Office is, um, like I was saying, Sheriff Gonzalez, was uh, insightful enough and supportive enough to start the Behavioral Health Division back in 2020. Um, the, the model comes from the top. Leadership has to show that it's okay to talk about it, which I think our leadership has done. Um, and then there have to be things in place, a structure where uh, there's continued trainings, there's continued discussions. Uh, for us, we have um, suicide prevention policy for employees that came out uh, last year. And there are certain things in that where we're incorporating suicide prevention throughout trainings. Um, we uh, have a peer support team that checks in with people that uh, is vital. Peer support has been shown to, to uh, significantly reduce negative outcomes. Uh, people that are involved with it, I think up to 90% say that they're glad they had a peer reach out to them. Um, we do wellness checks for people that come in uh, that are, are for people that are assigned to high exposure uh, assignments like crime scene, um, vehicular crimes, homicide, those type people come in and check in. Uh, they're required to check in. It's confidential, but it's a way to destigmatize um, our services. Uh, another thing is the fact that we're embedded. People are used to seeing us around. So we're clinicians, we're psychologists, we're uh, family therapists, uh, they're our group. And we're involved with education, so they might see us at the academy. We're involved with outreach. They might see us here at the jails. Um, we're involved with um, uh, prevention topics like suicide prevention. Um, we make uh, scenes, so they see us on scenes. We do uh, incident response after the fact. So all of that destigmatizes talking about it, reaching out to people, um, and, and the support from the top, I think, is important, too. So from the top down and the bottom up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All parts of the puzzle have to connect together in order for us to be able to fulfill, uh, you know, the, the, the network as a whole. Um, as we come to a close, uh, I want to encourage everyone that is watching right now to tag a friend or tag a loved one and help us get this information out to all of the community. Uh, we all know someone that is strugg struggling with mental health symptoms or suicidal ideations. Um, we all want to let you know that you're not alone and you're not broken. There is help out there and there is hope and all you have to do is just take the step to reach out. September is Suicide Prevention Month and we want to invite everybody to help us stop the stigma that is surrounding mental health. Don't be afraid to ask your closest friend or your colleagues or even your family members um, if they're okay, if you notice that they, they're struggling. Um, most people in crisis just want to be heard. They want to be given the opportunity to, to express their thoughts and, and to be heard and to be validated. As we go through, I want to have you, Wayne, just discuss some of the suicide, or excuse me, some of the crisis lines uh, that are available that citizens can reach out to if they see, they see it necessary. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. And, and I'm going to put in a little plug for the Harris Center before I do that, because I know many of the people who are watching this are probably living here in Harris County. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier that we were the safety net behavioral health system. And what that also means is that um, we provide services regardless of people's ability to pay. So if you or a family member need behavioral health services and supports, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we, we do also have a role of answering um, several crisis lines in our community. The one that's probably most, that is the newest, but it's probably already the most well-known is 988. 
So July of last year, across the country, they designated the three-digit line of 988 to be for suicide and crisis um, prevention. So no matter where you're at in this country, if you dial 988 from your cell phone, from a landline, whatever, you're going to end up in a crisis center with mental health clinicians answering that call. Um, if you happen to dial 988 from a local area code or one of an area code that covers about 50 counties here in Texas, you will end up talking to a mental health clinician, crisis clinician that works for the Harris Center. So we've answered about half of the 988 calls from the state of Texas because we cover, uh, we cover Houston, we also cover the Dallas area. Um, in that 988 line, when, when you call 988, it will ask you if you're Spanish speaking, it will ask you to press a number, it will also give you an option to press a number if you are a veteran. Um, it'll also give you an option to press a different number if you are LGBTQI um, plus um, youth. I think it's under 26 or younger. Um, so that they can all access. I think there might be a special number of special number to press or it's coming online um, for um, other select population. Um, but there's also 713-970-7000 is a long established crisis line just for Harris County. Um, it's answered by the Harris Center. Um, I think they may be putting these numbers up for you to be able to see them right now. Um, the Sheriff's Office has a non-emergency line. Um, we have a mobile crisis outreach team. Um, and if you call that 988 or that 7000 number, somebody asked earlier about law enforcement responding. We have non-law enforcement response teams that can come out to homes, that can respond to a crisis. If, if there's a safety concern, obviously we're going to have to partner with law enforcement. But if it's just somebody in a mental health crisis, um, we can certainly respond without law enforcement. You don't have to call 911. You can dial one of those other numbers. Um, but I do want to normalize that outreach, right? You don't have to be thinking about suicide to call one of those numbers. If you are, please do call. But they're there just for people that are in crisis as well. You don't have to be thinking about taking or ending your own life. Um, you can call that number 24-7. It'll be answered by a live person once you push the prompt buttons. Um, and those people are there. That's their whole role is to be able to talk to you and, if need be, help someone respond to you or, if need be, help you find care in our community. Absolutely. And in addition to uh, the phone numbers that you can call, there's also some websites that citizens can check out if they want additional information on the different programs and services that are provided by either the Harris Center or by the Harris County Sheriff's Office. And if you click on the link um, on harriscountycit.org, there's the top right-hand corner, there's a drop-down menu. Um, all of our programs are listed there and you're more than welcome to check all of them out and enroll in things like Project Lifesaver and Project Guardian and see what different things the Sheriff's Office has to offer when it comes to addressing mental health concern. One of the things that I wanted to add before we close is if a family member calls uh, 911 and they're requesting an emergency response for their loved one, when it comes to getting in contact with CERT or, or a crisis unit, uh, one of the questions was how can we get a CERT team dispatched? It's very important, again, when it comes to information that you let the dispatchers know as much as you can. If you believe that mental health is the cause of the behaviors of concern, then obviously you, you would want to let uh, the dispatcher know that. You can request to see if there is a CERT unit available that, that can respond to, to the scene um, for, for that interaction, or you can request, if, if a CERT team is not available, you can request for one of the core units, and again, that is C-O-R-E, core. Um, you can rec request and see if one of those deputies is available with the iPad for the telehealth assessment. Um, but again, I want to get the message out to, to all the citizens of Harris County that our goal and our mission right now is to get all of our personnel across the agency, regardless of assignment, uh, trained up in mental health awareness and crisis recognition uh, because it's super important and with, it, with increasing frequency, law enforcement is getting called to these situations more and more. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you for your questions, for your comments, and for your concerns. Each and every day, we are striving to better serve the citizens of Harris County, and we're doing it one step at a time. Again, 
we want to reemphasize that September is Suicide Prevention Month, and we encourage everyone to reach out to the different programs and services that are available throughout Harris County. Don't suffer in silence. There is help out there. Thank you, and have a great day.